Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. On this episode of the Becoming a Treasurer series, author Craig Jeffrey continues a mix of interviews around his book, The Strategic Treasurer, A Partnership for Corporate Growth. The chapter of discussion is entitled Communication, Mars and Venus, which explores the variety of ways the treasurer and controller see things differently. The reasons behind these differences are described and discussed, allowing for understanding between these two crucial financial players. Listen into the discussion to find out more. Welcome to the podcast, Craig. Thanks, Meredith. It's good to be here again. I'm, I, I've been enjoying our conversations about becoming a treasurer and thinking through the implications of uh, these topics. Perfect. Well, we're on part 22, and it's been such a popular series, so I'm excited to continue our conversation today. So today, I'd like to continue our conversation around another chapter in your book, The Strategic Treasure, A Partnership for Corporate Growth. I think the book offers a great mix of topics and insights to help treasures along in their career journey. The chapter I'd like to cover today is entitled Communication, Mars and Venus. To start us off, could you explain the purpose behind this chapter? Yeah. So... uh you know, I'm not sure if if this is still a popular thing. I think there was a there was a there is a book. You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, or or, or something along those lines that talked about uh, different communication styles and and thinking. The reason it's called Mars and Venus, or you know, understanding and minimizing the communication conflict, is that. Within within the finance group of a company, there's a number of players. It could be controllers and treasurers, uh, as well as you know, people that are doing FP and A uh, or, or other other activities. And if you are in another area of a company, you'd say, "Oh, that's finance." They all speak the same language, and that's true to a large extent. You know, it's much much more similar than marketing or product development or uh, human resources, but When you get down to it, there's a significant number of terms and ways of looking at uh, activities in an organization that are different. So you have a different purpose, a different primary direction you look at, and this can create all kinds of conflict, competing, I'll call it worldviews or, you know, view of the finance uh, world that, uh, that that create a problem. And so this is the reason for the chapter is to start saying, how are how are we different, and how can we better understand each other? Our 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 goals, our drivers, the words we use to make sure we're not equivocating on terms that one party thinks it means X, the other party means Y by it, and they're using the same terms. They're in essentially the same family, but mean something uh, mean something different. Um, that's that's great. There's a quote that you um, you started off the chapter with, and I thought that that was pretty interesting, and it, it kind of embodies what you're talking about right now. Could you could you read that for us? Yeah, sure. So through the looking glass, um, Lewis Carroll. Um, this this is a this is an interesting quote. It obviously was probably not geared for for Treasury, but but we're not sure on that, of course. Um, it says when I when I use a word. Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question, said Alice, is whether you can make words mean so many different things. And, you know, the book is very interesting in the conversation that they have and the word play and, and different types of thinking. But this is, a, this is important in terms of, you know, can you make words mean so many different things is really um, not that people are doing that per se, they're not making words mean different things, but we use some of the same words and they mean something similar, but different. Whether you're talking about cash, forecasting, working capital, there's a number of terms that mean something different. And if we aren't sure what the other person means, we talk past each other, come away with different understandings. And that's true. And, you know, um, depending on how the person heard it, they could hear things differently, even though that you mean something else. Um, so, yeah, communication is um, 
is a very important topic. What are what are the differences between treasurers and controllers? Well, and maybe maybe we should also um, expand it slightly to even say you know people that are focused on FP and A because these these may be separate areas, but the uh, uh, treasurers and controllers I think was the focus of the the chapter. Um, but you know, so what are some of the differences between treasurers and controllers and FP and A, for example? So a couple areas are the focus of what what they do, their views on control, um, you know, what their what their reason for being in an organization is, and and perspective. So some of the some of the differences, and I I don't want to overstate this too heavily, <clears throat> but if you think about well, what direction are people looking at? The primary orientation in terms of time, the uh, controller, um, accounting, um, primarily um, accounting and controller function is to make sure that the financial controls of an organization will accurately uh, report the financial performance, that it'll be um, uh, auditable, um, that it'll clearly reflect what's going on. And you know, it's it's recording primarily historical activity, and so the the view is primarily historical. It's looking left, so to speak, um, if we go left to right in terms of time. That's the primary orientation. There's certainly forward-looking aspects of it as well. You know, perhaps from a budgeting perspective, especially when we think about FP&A, um, they they tend to look at the future. But we'll get into some of those distinctions in a moment. Uh, Treasury, the treasurer, is primarily oriented towards the future. Um, what does our cash position need to look like over the next week, month? What does our balance sheet need to look like as we expand out uh, two, three, or five years? How am I going to ensure that the organization has liquidity in the future? So that's a, uh, that's a key distinction. One is looking back to make sure things are accurately recorded and tracked. Problems can be detected, that there's longevity of the financial statements. And the other is looking to make sure that liquidity is you know, protected, available, uh, the balance sheet will support what the organization is trying to do. So those are two very related items. Um, and certainly the treasurer looks back at history to see what's going on. Controllers will look to see what are expected activities occurring for the quarter and that their that they're reporting will be accurate. But those are that, that's a core difference in terms of how um, you know how, how uh, their head is turned towards historical and towards the future. Both are vital. Um, so that's that's one area. Another um, you know another would be in the area of control, um, and this this is this is easily overstated. So I, I just want to say some qualifications up front so people aren't yelling back at their listening device for the, for the podcast. Um, if I uh, seem to be overemphasizing it, but on, on the control front, oftentimes the controller group wants to make sure that their controls will detect a problem and to some extent prevent problems, but it's, it's heavily oriented that they can certainly discover problems that exist. So it's detective controls tends to be the orientation of the controller function. And, um, many of them do quite a bit on the on the preventative controls as well. Treasurers are geared on protecting payments from a preventative standpoint. They have to stop money going out the door. There's a much more immediacy. They tend to have access to a far higher level of payments because they're doing treasury payments. So these are larger payments. They have access to a greater amount of funds. So they have to make sure that they have good preventative controls. They want to set up the banking structure to support good controls while supporting, um, you know, the accounting functions of an organization, uh, and that's a uh, that's a that's a, a fairly notable notable difference in terms of what they're doing and how both of them fulfill those types of roles. Those are those are a couple of the different you know, purposes and perspectives of an organization, you know, who's, who looks at after the most liquid assets of the organization, the, the cash, near cash, debt, borrowing, that's, that's the domain of the treasure. Um, who looks after the recording, the, the financial, uh, the financial statements, the process, 
the general ledger, the books of the company, that's the, that's the controller. And these are both vital roles that support each other using some of the same, uh, same terms. But those are, those are a couple of the differences to, to get us started. Thanks for that explanation. Going back to communications, given they use the same language of finance and even identical words to mean different things, isn't it a ripe environment for miscommunication? Yeah, and that's 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 like the reason. That's a huge part of the reason for that particular chapter. Um, yeah, so some of the words might be you know forecasting, working capital, cash, and and there's quite a few others. Sometimes we'll do presentations and step through a bunch of these. It's more like a therapy for finance people. But um, if you look at cash, the formally trained accountant says, well, there's a, a generally accepted accounting principle definition of cash. And, you know, this is how we record it. Um, we have to comply with it. This is our framework for understanding it. And that's the language of financial reporting. And so we'll use that. And the treasurer may use the term cash, uh, but they also may be thinking of liquidity. What do I have available? And so the issue of float is a non-concern in the uh, accounting world, or it's, it's very minimal. Uh, the, the primary reason is the primary purpose is to follow the principles of, of gap, for example. Um, you know, so anything with a delay and I hate to use the example of checks, but I think everyone will understand that as a uh, you issue a uh, you issue a check and they'll immediately reduce the cash balance on the general ledger to say, hey, the the cash is is gone from an accounting standpoint, even though the check may not be mailed, it may not clear for a number of days. And we can think about float in different methods as well, but they will have a lower level of cash. And so all outstanding checks are treated as the cash is gone. And it is from an accounting perspective, but any treasurer worth their their weight in in Bitcoin will be will use the cash that's that's float to pay down debt or uh, invest more heavily or, or be more efficient because they're they're concerned about liquidity. Now you have to comply with GAAP, but you also have to make sure you're having good use. You have a proper stewardship of your um, of your most liquid assets. And so this is an area where people will say cash, people will say liquidity, treasury may get into an argument and say real cash, you know, what we can use. And, and then, um, you know, the, the controller or the accounting group will say gap cash, or they'll say cash, and they view that as the real, the real cash. And so it's important to understand those different components. And there are certainly ways to satisfy both of those needs effectively, even through the general ledger um, and leveraging that with automation. And we have, uh, I think we spoke about cash boot camp, and I explained some of the ways of doing that. And that, that's like, how do you keep both people happy um, and do the right types of activities that support good financial controls uh, that comply with GAAP, as well as um, proper stewardship of your assets? Um, that a treasury be concerned about. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I, I think one of the biggest challenges for business professionals, especially finance oriented folks, is communicating in a way that is easily understood by others and let's say other groups or departments like finance, communicating with marketing. Um, how do you convert terminology into an easy and understandable language? Do you have any helpful examples for that? Yeah, yeah, I can I can think of uh, I can think of a number, and I'm I'm just trying to think of you know there's the how do we communicate within the finance realm, how do you communicate to executive management, and then how do you make these terms make sense within maybe the business area, people that aren't financially oriented, and so um, the challenge here is to make sure we're communicating in a way that the re the recipient understands, and so. If you know how they think, you can do a better job off the bat, but you have to make sure that there's this, uh, whether it's humility or just making sure that they're receiving the same message that makes sense in a language they understand. Um, and the light bulb goes off. And, you know, same thing when you're trying to understand what an area is doing. This uh, this makes sense. So I'll, I'll give a more finance concept that's related to uh, cash, you know, 
working capital, and then I'll give something that's related to sales in a way that uh, that that translates um, into these different domains. So, for example, you know, we talk about um, you know working capital. Oh, we have a working capital program. What does that mean? And so, part of that is how do we understand what working capital is and if you've listened to our podcast, you probably heard something on this already, but um, there's a definition of working capital, which is the accounting and oftentimes banker definition, which is current assets minus current liabilities. And this is simply a method of showing that the organization has sufficient liquidity to meet its obligations or payment requirements as they come due. And so when you think of current assets like cash or receivables, okay, I've got enough of that to cover my payables, any type of you know liability or debt that's coming due, that that makes perfect sense. So that's a measure of, not necessarily a measure of cover, but a measure of managing short-term liquidity to make sure that the company is solvent. Now we talk about, we need to manage working capital. Um, do we want to increase working capital? Do we want to decrease it? There's another definition of working capital that relates to the cash conversion cycle. And this, this, takes, uh, this takes cash out of the equation. This is you know, receivables, payables, and, uh, and inventory. And so this is the idea that um, any changes in those has an impact on cash. So increasing your inventory means you have to use cash to increase your inventory. You draw down your receivables um, by collecting better, and you generate more cash. And so there's a uh, those those three items resolve themselves to cash. And so if we're talking about we need to optimize working capital, it's really thinking about how do I speed the business process up for converting money into inventory into products, for example, in a let's say a manufacturing environment two receivables and I collect that. And inherently the treasurer knows that it's far better to have cash than accounts receivable. You can spend cash that's in the bank account versus uh, a receivable, which you may or may not know when it's actually coming in. And so that's a, uh, you know, so we're having a working capital optimization program means we need to understand what's the right level we need um, of, of working capital, make sure it makes sense. There's are some examples of what this means. Um, someone who's uh, in charge of procurement, for example, another finance area, may, uh, may have all of their goals weighted on um, cost, how well they negotiated things, and they don't care about the time value of money. Uh, they don't care in that that's not part, part of what they're measured on. And so they buy up a bunch of items to make sure that sales can happen and they get the lowest price because they're buying in great quantity. And this creates a problem for the working capital program that the treasurer is running because they just pulled a bunch of cash out of either a line of credit or out of their investments, pulled it into, um, you know, into the, into inventory or, um, you know, as a way to, to help sales or decrease their, their cost, increase their margin but left off the other implication. So, you know, part of this communication is understanding up and downstream and understanding different motivations and using the same term. So I know that's a lot more than just the Alice in Wonderland. When I use a word, it it means exactly what I intended to mean type question. But that's a that's an example. I'll pause there because I I have another example more related to sales. Oh, good. I love examples. Perfect. You know, I think you said, how do you how do you change uh, terms so that it's easy and understandable? And I don't know that I answered that in that example, um, but let me let me try to answer that for the example, you know, of talking to someone who might be outside of finance and the VP and treasurer for Home Depot. This was this was a number of years ago now, so the the factors are probably off, but this was this was remarkable to me, and that's actually where that. Uh, panel discussion that I that I ran before I started the strategic treasure had the treasurer from Home Depot and a number of other organizations and it was called the strategic treasure um, and that uh, that uh, that's where the name came from that that panel discussion and some of the concepts that came out of that but uh, sorry for all that um, side rabbit trail but since we're talking about the looking glass there are definitely rabbit holes. 
but you know they were they were talking on the sales side. They said, "How do we communicate the the need to drive revenue, for example, and put it in terms that make sense?" And they they talked about you know if we have if everyone who comes through the line at you know, this huge um, home improvement store uh, comes to the line, picks up a dollar worth of you know stuff at the at the register, whether it's a bottle of water, a small screwdriver, whatever those things are that whatever's sold at the register. If everyone who comes through picks up a uh, a dollar worth of 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 goods or services, that will increase revenue. I think at the time it was almost exactly a billion dollars. And that's pretty easy to understand. So if you're like, hey, we're going to pay attention to making sure that stuff at the revenue at the register um, is available, that's a billion dollars. I don't know how many stores that's equivalent to, but just being wise and thinking about how do these things work, that can make someone who's not finance oriented at all turn their heads and say, wow, that's that's significant. That would be, you know, maybe that's equivalent of, I don't know, 10 stores or some such number, but it's very, very significant, uh, a way to, you know, increase your revenue by helping people understand your actions have an implication. You buying $30 million more of the HVAC material to get your price down, you know, defeated two months worth of work we had trying to reduce our working capital because you saved a few dollars and that, uh, that had an overall negative impact, but your key performance indicators and your goal, your desire to meet those had a negative effect somewhere else. So part of that's communicating well, giving terms and language that works. To support the success of an organization, it's important that colleagues communicate effectively with each other. In this case, what are some ways that can foster good communications and understanding between the treasurer and controller? Yeah, and, that, and that's that's a, that's a crux of the the matter and the issue, p- particularly between the treasurer and controller. But it it doesn't end there. It ends. It, it it I don't know where it ends, but it certainly includes communicating with um, the rest of the executive group wh- who may have no finance expertise. Um, but you still have to communicate in a way that helps them understand. That's that's your job to communicate well, and so. When we think about treasurers and controllers and controllers and treasurers, um, effective communicators, not just finance communicators, but they, they'll, they'll have clarity in what they're communicating. They will confirm what they're saying and what they're hearing. Um, and they'll take pains to understand what guides the other person's thinking, um, what's important to them, what principles they follow, what's their key performance indicators, their measurements, what they're motivated uh, by, and this allows them to communicate well. So this is, you know, can you talk to everybody in the room, whether it's the the executive of the firm, someone else in finance, someone in IT, someone maybe that's got a customer facing role. It's like, how do we, how do we put ourselves in their shoes as much as possible? And, And part of that is, you know, let's, let's not assume we think all the words are the same, have the same meaning behind them, because oftentimes they don't. There might be other assumptions. Um, and you know what's motivating people, and what will what will create a reaction? You know, if you say, "Well, we don't care about generally accepted accounting principles," well, that's not going to work well because your organization has to comply with generally accepted accounting principles. So it can't be a win lose venue there. There's lots of creative solutions that will allow you to get what you need while supporting generally accepted accounting principles, as an example. Um, So, yeah, really understand the the responsibilities, work to be clear, uh, confirm the activities. And, you know, that's not a one time activity. Um, It will it might require multiple uh, points of contact and be seen more as a a process, not just an event. Let's take a look at some finance areas and talk about who should drive what. Let's start with cash and liquidity management. Any thoughts around that? Who who owns cash? Who owns liquidity management? That's clearly in the treasurer's domain. That's they have specific responsibility for that, but they don't, 
own or have everybody in the organization that has an impact on those areas or can influence uh, how quickly cash is uh, collected or how things are dispersed. So um, they should drive the measurements there, make sure that the communication is clear and understand the stewardship role of protecting access to the most liquid assets and uh, promote good stewardship, good use of those assets uh, throughout the board. So that's that's clearly a uh, ownership by uh, treasure. And so they need to drive effective use and they need to convert that because there's other activities that will have an impact on both cash and liquidity, everything from inventory to sales, to margins on activity, and it needs to be resolved or communicated in a way that uh, the other areas understand the back and forth aspect of those activities. And, you know, Treasury, if we talk about, well, maybe broader liquidity management has an influence on working capital or working capital has an influence on liquidity. Um, If you try to tighten things up too much to reduce working capital, you can prevent sales reduce margin and create a negative trend in that way too, because you're focused only on finance, not on the business at large. So um, it's not just uh, treasury needs to help other people understand treasury and they do, that is their role, but they have to make sure they understand the business, the overall effect on the organization. So it's um, everyone has to be a learner of what the others are doing. What are some other ways to minimize conflict between treasurers and controllers? Have you experienced any situations in your career? Of, of conflict or minimizing? Both. Minimizing, minimizing the conflict. Um, minimizing the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe both. Feel free to share. Well, you know, um, you know it's, it's maybe it's how do we apply that concept of speaking the language of the other person? Um, you know, my, my formal training was in accounting, but don't tell anyone, but I don't love accounting. I love treasury, but I, I, you know, it's necessary. And, you know, I guess there's a couple, couple aspects. Let me give you some meandering comments as background before I, before I, I give an example of that is, you know, when you go through accounting and you're, you know, you're, you're studying and, you know, you hear the, the language of finance is accounting. And, um, you know, I swallow that, I swallow that whole. And, you know, as, as we've gone through uh, my career and worked with many, you know, CFOs, controllers, um, head of GL, um, you know, finance people across the board is, it seems like it's pretty clear that um, accounting um, is, is the language of financial reporting. And it's essential that you understand the language of financial reporting, that, that's crucial. And the language of finance and the language of treasury is a little different, but that language, the the treasury principles that come about and liquidity management and risk management and some of those areas, that's the language of finance. And so the language of finance, the language of financial reporting can be different. And we need to understand that. Um, I think most people as they, as they're approaching being a treasurer or controller, they understand some of these different aspects. Um, you know, there's a there's a significant difference between um, you know income on an income statement and cash flow. Um, you know, because we we lease something versus we purchase something, the income statement may look the same in a particular year, but you bought something and spent you know five million in capex on it. You have five million less cash versus you're leasing something for a million that year and have 4 million more in cash. So I think there's a, there's an aspect of we, we want to understand the language differences and where things go on. But, you know, I found when we're trying to optimize something for treasury and you have to, you have to get things done through other areas, whether it's accounts payable, the controllers group, uh, you know, a business area, you have to understand what's going on and be able to explain things in their language. So if we're trying to say, we, we want to be able to see uh, float through our financial statements and we want to be able to record things through the system. You can, if you get in an argument about, well, that's not according to gap, you're not going to win that argument if you approach it that way. Cause you're saying break generally accepted accounting principles. 
And you don't want to do that. You want to say, well, here's what GAAP says, and here's what we need in Treasury for better visibility, improved performance, you know, improve, you know, um, improvements in forecasting, whatever. And here's how we would like to do it. You might end up saying, here's how it's going to work. And you draw some, you draw T accounts, for example, perhaps with the accounting group. And as you're explaining it, they're like, oh, that's how it works. That maintains the control for, for gap purposes. This is great. And then you have to show at the same time, you have to communicate to IT in a way that they're going to understand. Oh, here's a system feed. Here's how the, the file is balanced and controlled at this point. And, and, and they're like, oh, okay, I get that. So it's, you have to be able to talk in a language and in a way that the others will understand. And maybe you know their language well, maybe you don't, but, but asking questions and restating things in ways that the others understand really makes things go a lot smoother. Um, so don't just assume everyone has the same lexicon in their head of, you know, words and hierarchies of understanding in your own head it is always the same because it's not it's easier to talk to people that where there's like a lack of diversity of in this case diversity of um, terms and you know maybe your pedigree in a business hey i like it when i talk to people who can understand me exactly as you know ha having shared experiences in cost accounting or treasury or ap or whatever but we have to think about that um there's a lot of different experiences mentally. Uh, I know that's not the common definition of diversity, but this this idea of uh, different business experiences, we have to understand those. So, so some of the same principles apply in that in that way. So, um, that's great advice. Yeah, very very good advice. Um, any final thoughts on today's discussion? Are you enjoying reading all this material? I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> reading, reading the book and summarizing these chapters, I'm like, is this is this terrible or is this okay? I'm uh, I'm just wondering. I'm learning more and more about treasury every day <laughs> through your book. <laughs> that, is a, that is a good that is a good answer. I I you know I remember I remember when I was a kid and I was writing. I don't know if I've told you this, but it was it was early and this was um I, I want to say maybe it was fifth grade or sixth grade, I can't remember, but I wrote something about um, is solar power a viable alternative uh, source of energy. And and I wrote this whole thing, my mom looked at it and she was an English teacher and she said, oh my. And she literally took scissors and cut, and I don't think we use paste, but she cut and taped stuff to new papers to rearrange what went on. And, um, and yeah, obviously I got better at writing and organizing thoughts as time went on. Then when I wrote the book and it was published, I gave it to her. I was like, oh, she's going to read it. <laughs> she's going to read this book on treasury. And she didn't. She, she didn't. You know, she, 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 she looked through it until she could find the first grammar or punctuation mistake. Thankfully, it took her a while. She said, "Oh, here's here's a here's an error somewhere," and then she was done. Then she was done with the book, and there was a the, the little boy in me was a little bit sad, and I was like, "Yeah, that would be a like a horribly boring book to read if you you weren't in there." So that just shows you the, uh, yeah, that's where I was coming from with that. I, I'm not sure why I, read, I know. Uh, I love it. Why I went down that course? That's great. No, I love it. That's a great way to end this this uh, episode today. Craig, thanks so much for taking the time to share some, some more insights from your puck. And I look forward, as always, to catching up soon. All right. Thanks, Meredith. Take care. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.